okay uh, jai hind everybody uh, indo pacific uh, really has become a watchword in the entire uh, domain of uh, multiple nations in the domain of think tanks and all those who are directly or indirectly connected uh, with the issues of their respective national security or otherwise you political issues now at the same time it is not a mathematical equation where you know two plus two makes four there are always differing perceptions we may feel in india that the entire western perception about indo pacific is same but that may not be the case from country to country from grouping to grouping there may be differences in perception so we are very fortunate today to uh, have dr swasti rao amongst us uh, who shall be taking us to that aspect you know basically as to how different nations uh, have their perceptions about indo pacific and i'm sure uh, you will also bring out in the process you know what could be certain uh, takeaways uh, for sure. india as a country sure. as this change so with that i hand over uh, the uh, mic to dr manojit das to introduce his speaker and then we'll request uh, how to deliver it on this oh, thank you sir welcome ma'am uh, so and now we talk to dr swasti dao dr swasti dao is associate fellow at the europe and eurasian studies manohar parikar institute for defense studies and analysis in pidc her current research project at in pidc is on conflicts in europe amid shifting power structures and europe's in the pacific outlook she is a geopolitical advisor to the uttar pradesh government on developing the up defense industrial corridor She is affiliated with EU India Women's Council and serves as a reviewer for peer-reviewed publications by Royal United Services Institute in London. Uh, Dr. Rao is a widely uh, published author. Her work on Ukraine war is soon to be uh, compiled as a book by HarperCollins. Besides, she is a regular commentator on uh, IR across nation, uh, national and international media platforms. She has been representing India at the flagship EU Security Dialogue, the Schuman Forum. Uh, held at the European Parliament at Brussels since March 2020. Before joining MPIDC, she was teaching courses on international politics, European security at Anvir Muslim University. She has contributed to syllabus development for political science at IGNU. And Dr. Rao is also a trained Kathak artist and a scholar on Kathak and performance. Not very relevant for today. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, and. Uh... I believe I am supposed to be delivering a forty-five minute uh, lecture, and uh, thank you for this wonderful time. You know, we are now we are so used to speaking for ten minutes, twelve uh, minutes that this this looks like a really unique, uh, so to say, uh, opportunity. So, well, thank you very much for having me over, and uh, uh, it, it is very interesting. This particular lecture that uh, we are going to be uh, having today is basically a kind of a spillover from a conversation I was having with Akshat because he just wanted to have some discussion on how the U.S. and everything uh, actually plays out in the Indo-Pacific, and then. in that very informal conversation we were having uh, you know it just uh, so that you know he said that oh that's very interesting because not many people for example in the indo pacific realize that we are, we are so used to saying collective west and we are so used to saying west that sometimes we often look at it as a monolith right so the uh, so then of course uh, it it then led to this uh, uh, engagement today and uh, like i said that today the the idea of the lecture for you is to help you understand Uh, that west is not a monolith when it comes to indo pacific uh, of course there are different different perceptions of how uh, what we refer to as collective west actually looks at indo pacific and uh, obviously then how does that kind of open up a, 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 an array of choices and opportunities and also challenges for india because india of course is such a key player when it comes to the indo pacific region and especially the indo ocean region so uh the other thing that i'd uh, like to say is that of course just feel free to ask me whatever you uh, wish to ask later um what i have done for you i'm sure you have some print out in front of you like a summary that i shared with the uh, you know monojit earlier and the idea is to basically tell you not just about the us and the quad but also acquaint you with more western countries like for example the european union as a whole of course everybody knows about france because france is a resident indo pacific power but it's not just that you keep hearing that so many indo pacific uh, uh, strategies have been released by different uh, european countries the latest is sweden and sweden released its indo pacific strategy 
day, three, four years, uh, three, four days ago. So it looks like a very uh, crowded space. Because, so on the one hand, you have different Indo-Pacific strategies. On the, on the other hand, you have some resident powers, for example, like the UK and France that have a completely different approach to Indo-Pacific. Then you have the US and the US-led initiatives. Of course, India is a part of Quad, but then the US is also here through AUKUS. And then the UK is also here through something called the GCAP. Okay. And so how do you, and then uh, we, we heard in 2022 that NATO is trying to develop a pivot to Indo-Pacific. So how do we make sense of that? What does that entail? And then finally, as if uh, it wasn't a crowd enough, you also have the five eyes intelligence sharing network in the Indo-Pacific. So idea is to sort of give you this little overview of what is the difference. And finally, I would also end with where I feel that what is the best opportunity for India to capitalize on this particular pivot. I will also tell you certain limitations. Okay, so everything looks very good on paper. And especially when it comes to Europe, you will see that Europe is very good with paperwork. Okay, so you everything looks very wonderful and beautiful and sorted on paper, but ultimately the Proof of the pudding lies in the eating, so we will have to see what kind of budgetary allocations do they have. Uh, can they really pivot to Indo-Pacific considering that they have a Ukraine war going on in their neighborhood? And if there is a Ukraine war going on in the neighborhood, uh, does it also necessitate you know, their pivot to Indo-Pacific? So I think this is brought by and large the kind of discussions that we are having today. Uh, so like I said, that let's begin. Now, before I come to the uh, Western powers, uh, let's just look at how Indo-Pacific uh, actually has become a kind of an analytical tool for India. We all know that there has been this shift from the continental domain where we're constantly looking at, uh, you know, our border disputes with Pakistan on the one hand and then China on the other hand. And then around 2015, when we came up with an Indo-Pacific, uh, with a maritime strategy, and then 2018, Prime Minister Modi was at Shangri-La dialogue and then we gave this, you know, speech. And then we see that there's been this this shift okay to to the maritime domain and the maritime domain has become so important for india in fact today india's most important strategic partnerships are actually the kind of partnerships where you see that indo pacific is somewhere playing an important role so uh, very quickly uh, i think it is there is no under there is no overstatement in saying that uh, this is a pivotal theater of contemporary global geopolitics. It is characterized by dynamic shifts in power and influence, and we all know that this is also a hotbed of U.S.-China growing rivalry. So, I mean, I'm assuming that you already know this little background of why Indo-Pacific is so important, why uh, you know everybody's looking at it. There are important sea li lanes of communication, and because I was uh, you know looking at the Western pivot, I kind of tried to not mention the usual ASEAN and where exactly are the problems in the Malacca Strait. So, you know, we will take it as a background. But um, from India's perspective, it is a pivotal theater, not only for India, but for the rest of the world. Then from India, if you see, I mean, the way we've been looking towards our east and in the maritime space and towards our east, if you know that, just to give you a little perspective that after the Cold War, you know, we started with the Look East policy. And the Look East policy was largely about uh, developing ties with ASEAN countries, etc. Now, this evolution, okay, of the look east, then later on by 2014 became act east, right? So we all know that this was in response to how she's China was behaving suddenly because before Xi Jinping came to China, there was a very different China. Okay, so China before 2012 is very different from China after 2012, and especially after 2013 when it launched the BRI, which slowly and steadily started to become a headache for India, and therefore the look east became act east. So you could see that it is becoming. So in in my writings, I've I've argued that. You, know, you see this performative performative shift here from a, a kind of a passive engagement of this region to a more active engagement of the region. And I think this is something which will um, remain to be something uh, very, very common and constant in the Indian way of foreign policy. Like, for example, you must be hearing that there are things like, you know, earlier it was non-alignment, which was passive, and now it is multi-alignment, which is active. So I think there is a very important role of performatives and we see i see the role of performatives you know playing out in different ways when it comes from lokis to actis or non-alignment to multi-alignment etc etc so we will keep talking about it but i just wanted to introduce this conceptual you know thing for you that this is becoming a performative so you have an actis then and then this has become this is coming in response to she's china uh, and then you have a more broader and more comprehensive partnership uh, developing with more key asia pacific nations such as japan south korea australia vietnam and not just the asia 
Similarly, you will see that uh, it is not just that, but again, to counterbalance China, there are other, uh, you know, key initiatives under the ACTIs that India starts to do in, with respect to infrastructure projects, etc. Now, for example, very quickly, just to give you that India started with the India Myanmar Thailand Trilateral Highway. India also boosted its participation in regional forums such as the EAS and the ARF, etc. And then this was complemented slowly by neighborhood first policy and beam stake, etc. So then in 2015, like I earlier mentioned, that Modi articulated what is called Sagar, you know, which is vision security and growth for all in the region. So I'm telling you all this just sort of revise. I've not really started with the Western pivot right now, but when we start, we will see that how these dots are connected to all of this. Okay. So we we have something called the Sagar. And ultimately, then you know, we came up with the um, you know thing called Indian uh, Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, which became a kind of a tool to sort of implement this vision of Sagar. So we have all these things. Especially since 2018, things have started to become more of a performative when India's engagement with the maritime domain can be discussed. And uh, in many ways, many authors and many scholars have said that it was Modi's speech at the Shangri-La, you know, that really sort of gave a uh, body to and, and yeah, texture to what India meant by its maritime strategy. So India's vision of Indo-Pacific, etc. And then, uh, like I said, that of course we have we had the Sagar, which was implemented by the IPOI. And then we also have something, another very key enabler, which is the IFC IOR, which is in Gurgaon. And then we will see how the Western partners are always looking forward to engage in the IFC IOR. Uh, in short, today, when we look at Indo-Pacific from India's perspective, it is not just free and open, but it is also inclusive, which means that it is not against anybody. So India's overtures in the region are not against anybody. This is not completely true when you look at the Western powers because they have a different perception of Indo-Pacific, but India the semantics that India has for engaging the reason uh, in this particular region actually come from a free, open and inclusive, which means that it's not against anybody. Uh, now, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that's of course up for discussion and we will discuss that later. Now, in recent years, if you see the real push that has come to India's, uh, you know, um, uh, engagement with the Indo-Pacific region is coming in a way very parallel, okay, to how the United States Indo-Pacific strategy has developed, and especially after 2018, when you see that the United States started to uh, deploy its uh, you know capabilities from CENTCOM to PACOM, and they in fact named uh, the PACOM as the Indo-Pacific Command, right? So you will see that that was happening. As a parallel, uh, there was also this thing of the India-US general strategic alignment growing stronger with foundational agreements being signed. Okay, then you also have the straight, uh, uh, you know, the the, uh, the strategic trade uh, authorization, etc. So you have a decade of developments that are leading to this kind of thing. But for sure, the United States pivot to into Pacific is to check the unilateral uh, change in status quo. That became very apparent as Xi's policies became more and more full for year oriented and more and more, uh, you know, uh, aggressive and they came up with the nine dash line, etc. So, you know, you have all this background there. Now, when you look at the United States into Pacific strategy, now this is articulated by successive administrations. So, regardless of who is in power in the US, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats, you will see that when it comes to Indo Pacific, there is a bipartisan consensus. So, that is something that obviously keeps India always in the in the uh, you know in the center of that attention because regardless of who comes now who comes to the US will uh, uh, in the White House will have a direct bearing of what happens in the war in Ukraine maybe what happens in Israel but when it comes to India you see that there is going to be a bipartisan consensus broadly so uh, you have all this so all these components that we've been discussing so far are collectively underscoring uh, when we when we talk about this India strategic realignment with whatever is happening in Indo-Pacific today. Now, when you talk about Indo-Pacific, so, so far we were speaking about India. Now, when you talk about Indo-Pacific, where is the Indo-Pacific? And for this, I had a map, you know, for you, but then ultimately I could not really uh, sort of decide on whether I want to do a PowerPoint or not. So uh, the map is right here. If you want, I, I'm very, very happy to mail it, this PowerPoint later to him, so you can probably take it. So, where is the Indo-Pacific? So, when you say the Indo-Pacific, I think everybody talks about a vision, but when you actually talk about the maritime borders, right, you will see that there is a difference. Uh, all the important stakeholders do not have a common imagination of the Indo-Pacific, right? So, the geostrategic frontiers of what is known as Indo-Pacific is different from India, is different for Australia, different for the United States, different for Japan, okay? And this is just the quad part. Right. Similarly, when you look at the European partners, you will again see that there is a difference because the, the, the French are going to be more worried about where the territories are. 
the germans are going to be more worried where the uh, economic uh, you know salience of communications are the swedish are more worried about where they can source the critical minerals for their uh, defense uh, you know modernization so on and so forth you know so the, the, the thing to remember is that you know this common thing that we often refer to as indo pacific actually doesn't enjoy a completely identical viewpoint okay so if uh, if if i could share the map you know you will see that yeah. the india's australia's perception is quite small okay uh, india is relatively bigger america and india kind of share the vision for indo pacific but you will see that america's frontiers of indo pacific actually stop at the uh, uh, you know uh, the eastern side of, uh, of of africa so for example everything which is going that the other side is actually sent for you know yeah yeah like that so in fact um, i actually should have done it but anyway please remind me i will send you the ppt later because i think there was no time but the point to remember is that not everybody has the same perception and that also actually tells you what their strategic interests are when it comes to this region so you will see the geo strategic frontiers of indo pacific are different for different players uh, because of this the strategic priorities also become different then you, we know that the great power contestation is going on everybody is worried about a worst case scenario what is the worst case scenario the worst case scenario is an armed conflict over taiwan straits or over china's claim in the uh, uh, nine dash line you know which is the south china sea and if this happens the biggest problem is that of course the countries in the region like japan and all will obviously be sucked into the conflict because if you look at taiwan straits japan already has a singapore island problem which is which is going to be you know sucked into it but if you look at other pl uh, players the main problem is disruption of supply chains and taiwan is so important for chips and this and that so this is where i think people uh, all the different players are uh, you know having a different perception so the us has a more hawkish view but at the same time you will see the, U the us is also trying to come up with a more comprehensive strategy on the contrary if you look at the europeans the europeans are actually pushing for multilateralism because in 2019 they came up with a phrase which was called a uh, partner a uh, partner competitor and a systemic rival and this phrase they dedicated to china so which basically meant that yes there are very important economic relations but at the same there's also competition because of you know all the subsidies that china keeps giving and now we see such an ugly uh, you know play out of the these subsidies issues when it comes to the evs when it comes to solar panels and literally you know china has completely surpassed everybody because of their policies of giving subsidies so they don't really encourage uh, fair trade practices but in 2019 they came up and they said that so china is a part china is a competitor but china is so systemic driver because of the way they use that economic state drift. and because of that they understand that they have too much economic dependence on china they cannot decouple nobody can decouple okay they can only de risk try to ensure the supply chains to more trusted trusted partners like india like vietnam etc but at the same time they understand that they are going to be the biggest losers if there was a worst case scenario coming through in the indo pacific and therefore they want to push for multilateralism this is a point which in my experience i think uh, we in india tend to miss about a lot of western partners that they are not there to piggyback the us they know that they will eventually have to piggyback the us if push came to shove which means that if there was a proper war they would have no no other choice but to piggyback the us because they are in a nato alliance with the us but when it comes to the indo pacific they are very clear we want to push for multipolarity number one we want to reduce the great power contestation number 2 and we want to give a third way out especially france is the one that says we want to give a third way out now when you get into the details of what really the third way out i will discuss when i come to france but these are things that it is important because what they also realize is that if you look at the resident countries in the region if you look at the pacific islands if you look at the smaller countries and most of importantly if you look at the asean countries they do not wish to take sides because the kind of economic dependence they have on china so clearly you see that europeans know the westerners know that indo pacific is a very important region but they do not wish to take sides and therefore they are pushing for multipolarity which is a little different from the way us looks at it because us is this binary about great power contestation and us is doing everything possible to check the rise of china okay uh, then you also have another very important geopolitical uh, you know a, a phenomena taking place because of the war in ukraine and because of for example what is happening in the red sea is that you know now the security theaters are getting interlinked 
Okay, so this interlinking of security theaters is also necessitating, you know, all these countries in the region to take a more robust view of what really the choices are. And ultimately, you will see that this is it is around the same time in 2019 to 2021, 2022, where you have most of these countries coming up with their individual strategies because they do not want any change in status quo. This is going to reflect on, uh, you know, the security of the maritime routes. Ultimately, the maritime commerce, and then nobody wants their supply chains to be disrupted because they cannot imagine a double whammy. They are already, uh, you know, the whole world was in the middle of uh, uh, recovering from COVID nineteen pandemic when the Ukraine war started. You know, the Ukraine was uh, Ukraine war triggered a food, fuel, fertilizer crisis. It is still going on. So much money is going to Ukraine. While Ukraine was happening, Hamas attacked Israel, okay? The Red Sea uh, was again uh, infested by the Houthis, okay? And India, you know that all our trade is now not going through the Red Sea. Now we are going all the way around the Cape. So this is a worst case scenario, which probably nobody in the world really wants, but because we have seen that there is such a huge, um, I would say propensity for these black swan events to happen. So therefore, people are really worried about what is going to happen. In fact, if I tell you most of the uh, scenario building exercises that I do with the Europeans, you know, whenever they invite us, or for example, the German foundations like FES or KS, it's always about what happens if there is a worst case scenario. What is going to be the choice that India will uh, do? What what is going to be the ASEAN countries doing? What is going to be the you know um, the the options before Taiwan, before Japan? That is all we are doing. It's scenario building to scenario building because then you realize that they are really so messed in their heads that they will not be able to sustain it. So. And very clearly, if I tell you the precipitate of what I've been trying to say is that so everybody wants a rules based order. Everybody wants a free and open Indo Pacific. From India's perspective, we also want an inclusive Indo Pacific. And this inclusive uh, element you will also see in certain European countries that do not want to sort of, you know, uh, alienate China too much. And this is particularly true of Germany because the Germany and Germans are very, very but it's just that the modus operandi is a little different. So the modus operandi, so the pathway that the US takes is different from the pathway that the EU takes, and the pathway that the French take, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think I took a long time for these because I just wanted to sort of give enough time to actually drive home the fact as to what really is the, is the foundation on which now we are going to be building. So very quickly, as a result, because Indo-Pacific is, is now uh, an integral part of uh, almost all discussions in geostrategic and geopolitical, geoeconomic decisions, it is becoming a very crowded space. In the Western countries, the predominant presence is that of the US, of course, we'll discuss that. Then there are resident powers, like I mentioned, UK and France. There are non-resident powers, but active powers like Germany, like Netherlands, like Czech Republic, like Sweden, and finally also Italy. Italy doesn't have a like a documented Indo-Pacific strategy, but Italy, uh, for Italy, it is usually said that they are doing a silent revolution. So we will come to that and see how, what kind of silence is there in that revolution, but you have all this. Then it is not just about individual countries. You also have trilaterals. You know, you have something called an AUKUS. You have something called, everybody knows AUKUS, right? AUKUS is about nuclear submarine, uh, uh, you know, engagement between the US, UK, and uh, Australia. And you know that France was mighty angry because the way they were kind of stabbed in the back and they were told to get out of it. And the, it, it took a long time for them to sort of get back and then, you know, join hands and all that. So there's AUKUS. Uh, there's also GCAP. GCAP is this fighter, this uh, next generation fighter aircraft program between UK, Italy, and Japan. Okay, then you have trilaterals like India, Australia, France, you have India, UAE, France, you have US, South Korea, Japan, you have India, Italy, and Japan, and so on and so forth. So now we're talking about trilaterals, then you also have plurilaterals, right? you have the quad, the most important plurilateral out there perhaps is quad. Then you have what is called from the EU's perspective, the EU Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum. Then you have, like I mentioned, you also have NATO evidence. What does that mean, right? Because obviously it, it kind of raises a lot of eyebrows in this part of the world because Indo-Pacific is a different theater from uh, from the uh, Euro-Atlantic one. Then, like I said, you also have five eyes. So this is what makes Indo-Pacific such a crowded space. And then we will have to sort of, you know, um, um, uh, as an laid thread. So, well, this particular side slide was about the different um, 
uh, you know, versions of Indo-Pacific, but I will go forward. And very quickly, now let's start with the US, okay? Now, of course, when you look at COD, uh, very quickly, I don't need to tell you so much about COD. It is not about, because COD is perhaps the most well-known from India's perspective. But what I can tell you about COD is that COD is not a, strict, uh, not a military alliance. From India's perspective, we will continue to be China agnostic, which means that we will rather not take the name of China, but everybody understands that China is the elephant in the room. Uh, in my perspective, COD is going to be important Apart from the vaccine diplomacy and all that, there are two important verticals for which God is going to be one, of course, is the economic leg of it, which is called IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And the other is the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain, which is about maritime domain awareness, right? Now, these two are important. Maritime domain awareness is obviously important because uh, ultimately Indo-Pacific is a maritime theater. So if you want to develop any security architecture in the Indo-Pacific, it has to revolve around maritime domain awareness. Now, the problem with maritime domain awareness is that it sounds very, I mean, much easier said than done. So India uses its own portal to develop maritime domain awareness. Other countries use their own information. portals. Till the time there is a real-time linking or in technical language, a near real-time linking of these different information portals. End of the day, you can't really take a collective or interoperable, you know, strategic response to whatever threats you are facing. And in fact, when I tell you about my own research about how can India best leverage, you know, the Western pivot to the Pacific, you will see that I'm speaking so much about that and to win. So, on the one hand, you see definitely the COD launched an Indo Pacific uh, Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative in 2022. Then, recently, when Prime Minister Modi went to the US, they also launched something called a Maitri. And Maitri is basically, uh, you know, this. Uh, a maritime initiative for training and then they also talked about launching a called maritime legal uh, dialogue and then this sea ship observer mission if you basically link all these things ultimately this is about trying to develop a better maritime security architecture because indo-pacific is this vast threat and even if you do, you, you don't have to wait for a real full-fledged war to break out in the indo-pacific Right? Countries in the region today are vulnerable to hybrid threats. Okay, and this is the beauty of the maritime domain awareness initiatives that you know when you are trying to build a maritime security architecture, you are not always talking about a full-fledged war. You are talking about the kind of threats that are there in the region, which are also a lot of hybrid threats. So you see that. So that is one element of thought which is quite important. The other is IPF. I already told you the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Now, from US's perspective, you know, this is interesting. Why? Because if you remember when Trump came to power in about 2017, he just withdrew from all the multilateral economic arrangements the US was a part of. So, CPTPP, America withdrew. RCEP, America is not there. IPF is the only real economic. You know why? Because America became protectionist. Okay, America became, there was trade protectionism in America. Trump came and launched all these trade wars. Trump launched a trade war with India also, you know, with, with China, with EU, with everybody. They said America first, and that's where it's coming. Make America great again. So one part of that is that, you know, don't do this uh, liberal trade or whatever, you know, make your trade more protections. So from that perspective, IPEF was certainly a departure for the U.S. because IPEF was the first such uh, multilateral economic framework that U.S. was a part. You know, uh, the thing about uh, IPF is that it has four pillars. The countries in the region are free to join whatever pillars they want to join, whatever pillars they don't want to join. So there is fair and resilient trade, there's environmental and digital labor and those kind of standards, there's supply chain resilience, infrastructure and all that. The thing with, from, from India's perspective is that India has not joined the free trade part of IPF which means that India is still vulnerable to its opening up its market, you know, to such, to so many players. And I think that protectionism still continues in India. So a lot of times when you hear that India has joined the IPF, please don't assume that India has joined all the four pillars. In fact, India has only joined a few pillars of the country. And this is an important thing because some days ago, you know, we had a, a delegation from Bangladesh and the Bangladeshis wanted to understand why have you not joined the four pillars? Because they wanted to somewhere do the same. Because countries in the region are not, you know, we are not so comfortable with opening up our, uh, you know, markets to, uh, to, to practices which will completely tra make trade uh, here very, very, com uh, you know, too competitive for us. Okay, we are not ready for that. We can't open it. So you have to somewhere understand that. Okay, so this is about court. 
Now, when you come to um, uh, the other Europeans, now I definitely would like to start with France because France is obviously the most preeminent strategic partner for India today, uh, especially as uh, you know after Ukraine war, you know, the choices with Russia are getting more and more complicated with the Russia-China alliance and all. That. Now, France is a resident power. It has EEZ, of course. It has it has people. It has about 1.5 billion French citizens in the you know French colonies here. Uh, now. Um, France obviously has an Indo-Pacific strategy. France was the first Indo-Pacific, uh, I mean, European country to actually come up with the Indo-Pacific strategy. And this came in 2019. Uh, France has already been here through different trilateral arrangements. In fact, when you talk about trilateral arrangements, France actually started with different kind of tri trilaterals in the 1990s itself. And uh, um, recently, of course, now as, uh, now as I told you that now they have patched up with Australia and now France, India and Australia are also together in a trilateral. So um, that's there. Now I had another map for you to show you uh, where exactly the French military presence is there in the Indo-Pacific. And this particular map also had a list of how many platforms is France a part of. But you know, if you ask me to, to conclude French military presence, of course, I'm going to talk more. But one thing about the French military presence is that the French like to talk a lot about strategic autonomy. The French like to talk about, you know, having their own way and not going down to, you know, to the US pressure, etc. But if you really look at the debate inside France, like if you were to go and speak to their, uh, you know, think tankers, their government uh, officials, the problem in front of France is the same. That they have a, they have an economic plan today. So when all these European partners talk about having an Indo-Pacific strategy, even though they say, oh, we want to do this, we want to, you know, uh, get into developmental projects, we want to uh, be in the International Solar Alliance with India. I mean, these are great frameworks and they have a lot of potential, but in terms of really living up to that uh, or materializing it, you know, uh, kind of implementing it, ultimately it is about the money is going to give the money and please remember that that is also one of the things that the indo-pacific country i mean the europeans when they come to indo-pacific realize is that they have to stick together okay if they don't stick together so largely they have to complement what the european union is doing especially when it comes to sort of you know these kind of infrastructural developments connectivity developments if they don't do it they cannot do it alone. so all this that you hear that autonomy third way out we will not bow down to him. We will not bow down to, you know, whatever. All this looks great on paper, but they cannot do it with the way their economies are suffering after the Russian war in Ukraine. They, they obviously don't have that kind of money to do it. And whatever money they have is obviously not going to change the rules of engagement if they don't stick together. So I think this is something that you, France is the most preeminent power in India. But end of the day, its most important strategic priorities are to protect its people, to make sure that New Caledonia doesn't become too anti-French, to make sure that, you know, uh, their islands don't become, because the, there is there is a huge colonial history out there. Yes. So that is their strategic priority, right? Their strategic priority is, uh, it's not to actually uh, deploy, uh, you know, military deployments or something to actually take down the Houthis. Whenever it comes to that, France is very quick to actually leave the US, right? It's only the US and UK that go together. France says, no, no, we need to do that. We don't want to do that. Because if you do that once, right, and that starts a kind of a chain reaction. So, you you know, it's, it's in many ways, it's a little tragic. You do understand that they really have these great sounding theories and great sounding plans. But on paper, in reality, it really doesn't reflect at a comprehensive response towards Indo-Pacific. Bilaterally, things are going good between India and France and all that. In fact, when it comes to between India and France, I would, should mention that um, for the longest time, it has always been about defense. The defense equipment, it has always been about defense industry, it has been about nuclear, uh, so to say, civil nuclear agreements, and it has been about space cooperation. So now, whenever the, the two sides meet, they are always talking about Indo-Pacific. So they have set up a lot of frameworks for engaging the Indo-Pacific, like I said, that France wants to put out a third way forward, you know, for Indo-Pacific. But end of the day, do they have the money to do it? Okay. And that is where you see that there is a huge difference between what they are saying and what they are really able to do. And that also tells us about the kind of limits that they would have that ultimately if push comes to shove, they are going to pick it up the US. Okay. No matter what kind of strategic autonomy or whatever they keep talking about. So 
that is so i have written french way is that no funds <laughs> so they have to focus on their own content continent and even though they are trying to do development projects so it is true that they are into some sort of you know uh, port infrastructure development they are into um, mangrove uh, so to say uh, uh, you know ecological balance but it is a drop in an ocean i mean are you going to take on china with this really so that is the whole point okay so um, that is where it kind of ends now with france i should definitely be speaking about um, the eu first because i don't want to come to a point where we run out of time because the others are not so important the, i think the eu should be mentioned that is important because the eu uh, has an indo pacific strategy that was released in 2021 now i already told you that this came a couple of years after china was for the first time labeled a partner competitor and a systemic rival which was a huge policy shift because the europeans they were so dependent for their economy on the on on china that nobody really imagined that this would happen okay now uh, traditionally if you look at the european union they've been more focused on the western side of indian ocean region because that was a side you know when they they uh, started launching their missions to control piracy etc but slowly you will see that the eu is becoming more and more aware of what is happening in this side of the indian ocean which is more relevant in many ways for india and for you know the growing uh, uh, you know dominance of china uh the eu okay now very quickly if you ask me there are so many things i mean i could speak for 3 hours about what the eu is doing in the indo pacific the ideas is it going to work now if you actually understand the european union's um, approach after the ukraine war what they have the 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 plan was always there but nobody really pushed them enough to actually come out with a plan so when you go and read the papers oh yes there is a strategic com strategic compass uh, which actually talks about the eu as a security act or what we should be doing there's a european defense fund everything is there on papers you know it's it's behind those big buildings in brussels it is really you don't get to see on the in practice part of it is now coming to reality because of what happened in the ukraine war because they realized that they cannot really do with this dependence on the us for the rest of their whatever existence so they have to put together a new security architecture so very quickly uh, and indo pacific is a key theater like i said because they are economic and they are a, they are a geo economic okay so in the eu you see that there is a bit of a transformation happening that from a geo economic block they want to emerge as a geo strategic and for emerging as a geo strategic block they have to first become a security actor right now when you go to brussels forums and all that you will hear that they are already referring to themselves as a security provider you know we here in india say but how are you a security provider you know being a security provider means something else the us can say it's a security but of course so for that for this transformation to happen they have to first become a security actor and once they are taken seriously as a security actor then probably in some due course they will become a security Now the thing is, what really do they have to do? They want to become security actor. They have to do basically two things. Uh, whatever I understand of the EU, uh, we are not getting into connectivity projects here. You know, the EU has massive connectivity projects. They have a global gateway. They have EU Japan connectivity projects. They have an EU India connectivity projects. They have something with Africa. So see, it is a geo-economic block. So there's no doubt that that part is very very dense. I'm talking about the strategic implication what they have to do is that they have to basically right now they're coming up with what is called the edtip edtip means the eu defense industrial base now the defense industry base is starting now and all their um, uh, you know targets are for 2030 so it is only in 2030 will be able to do a review of whether the defense industrial base could be could reach anywhere or it it was like a balloon that got inflated midway i don't think it is like a balloon that will get inflated midway it's because right now they are in in this existential crisis but how successful it will it be only time can tell nobody else can so additive which is in the continent they are trying to develop a european defense industrial base okay and it is it is lot of money lot of everything is planning is going there the second thing is about eu as a maritime act and in my opinion that is something which is much more relevant for india because if you get into the details of how eu and india have been uh, you know converging in the maritime space you will see there is a lot of convergence a lot of potential now very quickly since we are discussing the eu i must tell you that when you look at the european actors of course the french are there and they're so um, important strategic partners 
the EU's Indo-Pacific vision and the, the seven pillars of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy are almost identical to India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative and India's Ocean Indo-Pacific strategy. In fact, you know, in my slides, I've given you what are the seven EU pillars and what are the seven uh, India pillars. They are very similar. Now, just a simple thing, why are they similar? And the answer is the same, because both India and the EU are actually pushing for multipolarity. Okay, maybe when we look at the Western powers, we automatically think that, okay, maybe they're towing the US line. No, no, they are not towing the US line because the US can talk about decoupling, even though the US will not, but you can't even say decoupling. You can only de-risk, okay, and all that. So you will see, and especially in the maritime domain, you will see that the EU has some important tools with which India has already been cooperating. The first tool is called the EU NAV 4 missions, which is the EU Naval Force missions. Uh, the, the two most famous ones, the first is 2008, Operation Atalanta, which was about, you know, containing piracy, etc., the western side of the ocean. India was on board with it. Uh, the second is called Aspidus. Aspidus is a very recent one. Aspidus is right now under the Greek command. And this is also a EU NAV4 mission. And you see that India is very comfortable with joining these missions. India is not, sorry, India is not comfortable with joining the US-led missions, okay, which are mostly the CMF missions, the Combined Maritime Forces. Why? Because they're very hawkish. So recently, the Red Sea, the strikes on the Houthis were basically the uh, US-UK-led uh, missions, right? It was not EU, the French, the nobody went there, nobody went along. So you have, like I said, the EU NAV4 missions. Then you have something called a Combined Maritime Presses, the CMP. And the CMP is also a tool which has come after the war in Ukraine. While the EU NAFOR missions are very mission specific, so as long as there is a mission, there is deployment. Itself. The CMP is a little more uh, uh, ambitious. It talks about a permanent presence. So you understand, so it's not just mission centric like EU NAFOR, but relatively more permanent. The problem is that. Uh, the, the the countries in the region, like for example, they want to engage India. And India has a problem because India is like, what exactly the CMP for? So let's not forget that when we talk about the EU maritime tools, they are also a work in progress. But in my analysis, I see that the real convergence that India can do in the maritime domain, especially in the Indo-Pacific, is actually in these missions because India has it's comfortable, they push for multipolarity, they want to reduce the great power contestation. And they want to, uh, you know, uh, push for also economic multipolarity. The other things that the EU already has in the region, one is called SEWA. SEWA is uh, enhancing security uh, for all, uh, you know, in this particular, in Asia. Uh, in Asia. And the other is Primario. Primario is important because Primario is the security of critical maritime routes. So I'm sure, I mean, if you are not really studying about the EU, you probably would not even hear about these things, right? So it's it's just a tendency to uh, to assume that, oh, EU is just a geoeconomic block and they are here to sort of develop some ports, etc. The EU really has some tools. And if you look at how the EU-India maritime dialogue has progressed, you will see that there has been a lot of engagement the problem, if I tell you very quickly, is that what with the way I look at it is that we are still looking at outputs. Did some 1.5 track somewhere? Did another 1.5 track somewhere? Those are outputs. Till the time you connect the dots, they don't become to out. They don't lead to outcomes. So a little differentiation that you need to make when it comes to EU India is that we need to be focused more on outcomes if you want to make a difference. Otherwise, this little you know, something here, something there can just go on for the rest of the lives and it is not going to make a huge difference. Now, very quickly, this is more, mostly about the EU. Um, now, what, like I said, that towards the end, I'll also tell you about what, through my research, uh, you know, what uh, what suggestions can I give? So in my research, what I've found is that if you're looking at the Indo-Pacific region, okay, one leg, of course, is the economic, uh, you know, leg, which is that India has to be a part of the connectivity projects. And there is a lot of overlap that is happening. It is not really the main focus of what we're discussing here today, because like the connectivity is uh, particularly, but connectivity is something that connects Connectivity, uh, you know, all this uh, um, technological, so to say, uh, connection, um, you know, overlaps, all the investment. I mean, those are wonderful things with the, with the Western countries, right? I and mean, we should do that. In fact, India's first FTA with the developed countries is actually with the non-EU countries, the EFTA countries, which is a group of four countries, right? And uh, only today, I mean, I, I kind of published uh, a piece on it in strategic analysis. Anyway, so coming back. What I wish to say is that through my research, I say, of course, one is the economic leg. Economic leg is very, very important. 
whether or not we enter into the free trade space or not, you know. So whether we join the fourth pillar of IPF or not, but as long as we are getting investments, as long as we're getting, I mean, that is something that we really need to focus on. But in the more strategic dimension, we need to basically get our act together for around the MDA initiatives. I already mentioned the core MDA, like Metri and all of that. But we, but what I have been trying to push is that for, for, for example, the European companies, because they want to afford multipolarity, because they want to reduce the great power contestation, because they want to, uh, you know, protect the sea lanes of communication. And like I said, that everybody is worried about a worst case scenario, which is a, an all out war. So what I have been suggesting is that the EU is rightly positioned. When I say the EU, it is complemented by the other European uh, you know, countries, which like France and you know, Germany and all of them, because they mostly have the same vision when it comes to this. They should try to put together a dedicated center for tackling hybrid threats, because when they will take that route, this is something hybrid threats by nature is something which is gray zone, which is not into this binary of a great power contestation, militarization, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't call for very serious military deployments because then, you know, countries in the uh, European countries don't want to get into that. Okay. And the good thing with hybrid threats is that what not many people know is that they already have a center for excellence in Helsinki. Because if you remember that until Sweden and Finland joined NATO, their eastern flank was extremely vulnerable. You know, that was their weakest link, actually. So for that, I mean, Sweden, Finland joined NATO only in 2022 and 2023, right? But all these years, they've tried to put together a hybrid center of excellence, which was dedicated on hybrid threats. So undersea cables, underwater, you know, the uh, the sea drones, you know, how to protect. And, and those are things where you have to join hands with the private sector, because most of the companies are actually belonging to the private sector, right? These are not uh, government companies. So what I have been trying to basically argue is that if you want to be taken seriously as a security actor, let alone provider, you should not be looking at, for example, big deployments, because big deployments will always have a cap. Today we say with the EU, okay, today you want to talk about coordinated maritime presence, okay. What if tomorrow France says, okay, that we don't get along with US, something like AUKUS happened and now we don't want to accept that ship. Then what happens, right? So what we tell them, uh, we tell them as in, you know, what makes more sense from India's perspective is that instead of getting into these rather straight jacketed things, which are great with bilateral powers, but not with European Union as a whole, not with 27 member states, right? With 27 member states, what we can do is that you can sort of uh, uh, you know, you can replicate your uh, your experience, you can replicate your technology, you can replicate your different stakeholders, you can bring it to Indo-Pacific because in Indo-Pacific, even though we have little, little, uh, you know, plurilaterals and, uh, you know, uh, these kind of trilaterals that, that are looking at that are looking at hybrid threats, but we do not have a dedicated, uh, you know, initiative that actually only talks about hybrid threats. So hybrid threats are stopped in quad also. Hybrid threats are, are there in the second pillar of AUKUS also. The first pillar is about, uh, uh, you know, nuclear technology. Second pillar is also about hybrid threats or not. Similarly, GCAP, which is this next generation fighter aircraft program between Italy, Japan, and the UK, that also has two pillars. The second pillar talks about hybrid threats. But it is hybrid threats are still in the margins. And what I argue is that if you you can actually bring it more mainstream. And when you bring it mainstream, mainstream, countries in the region will not shy away from joining it because hybrid threats are something which are considered kosher. You know, they are some, and they are countries in the region are very vulnerable to disinformation, to disruptive technology, to undersea, you know, protection of the undersea uh, communication cables and, and you know all the infrastructure. So that is where the EU can really take a lead. It is a regulatory power. It is a normative power. You know, it is not really a hard security power. So look at the. Uh, look at the softer side of non-traditional threats, right? Don't look at the hard side of the same. Okay, otherwise with our individual bilateral countries, especially with France, the relationship is going very steady. We will see whether they have the money to actually uh, contribute to the Indo-Pacific or not. But otherwise, bilaterally, our relationship with France is going very, very steady. I mean, we are probably uh, buying the Rafale Marines also, and probably we are also going to help us build the nuclear submarines, uh, the, the, new, uh, the, uh, the diesel electric uh, ones, right? The, the diesel powered ones. Uh, okay, those ones. And then uh, perhaps with Germany, we might get into the largest strategic partnership model with Germany for the AIP, uh, you know, technology, the air independent, because there are only Spain and Germany to contend with. So it is either. So what I'm trying to say is that individually speaking, our defense uh, 
thing is going very steady. The economic, uh, you know, things are also, I think, steady. When it comes to Indo-Pacific developments, we must take it with a pinch of salt. So you will see. Uh, so today, what I have basically done for you is that I have tried to tell you what Indo-Pacific is, how India looks at it, how the major powers look at it, and then what really can we do about it. Now, just as a postscript, because this is by and large the main body of what I wanted to discuss, just as a postscript, we must also be mindful that, yes, there, the Indo-Pacific environment is also changing very quickly. Okay, So NATO is pivoting, like I said, NATO. So I think we also somewhere need to understand what it really means for India. So on the one hand, India will never join anything like that formally. It doesn't make any sense for India to join. When we are not even naming China in court, why the, why the hell are we going to, or do we even uh, need to think about joining you know, something like an Asian NATO? It was Japan, right? The new prime minister in Japan, the Shigeru Ishiba, who's just come. I mean, he's like the biggest hawk or, uh, or something. You know, he just came and he said that we want to launch Asian NATO. <laughs> France said, no, 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 we don't want it. And then everybody saying, no, no, we don't want it. But what I'm saying is that NATO is pivoting to Indo Pacific under a document called a strategic concept. If you look at the NATO documents, NATO, every 10 years they, they come up with their uh, policy documents. So in 2022, they came up with a policy document that for the first time listed China as the main challenge, right? So until then, they had never listed China in their papers. So because China is listed in the papers, number one. Number two, because the strategic concept 2022, and this happened at the Madrid summit, um, because, uh, you know, they, they talked about a 360-degree view of security, which means that this is not just about what is happening in the European theater, but disruption to status quo, all over the world, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, which is going to be a pivotal theater because of sea of communication, etc. Because of that, they have already talked about their pivot to Indo-Pacific, but so far they have not deployed any, I mean, bad budgetary allocations or something. But what I want to say is that um, they will eventually find out ways. They already have Asia-Pacific partners, like they have a NATO plus mechanism. India should obviously not join NATO plus. It doesn't make any sense. But as far as the track 1.5 and the track 2s are concerned, that is already happening. And I think what India should be look, keeping its eyes open for is that what really does they have to say about hybrid threats and what really do they have to say about you know, those kind of things? Because in their own theater, they are dealing with the 360 degree view of security. And about five eyes. So five eyes, if, if you remember when five eyes had come, and this is probably the last point, when five eyes had come, everybody was like, okay, is India going to join the five eyes? Is Japan going to join the five eyes? Nobody is going to join the five eyes. The five eyes are going to remain five because they are a group of Anglophone countries that speak English. Okay, even though we speak more English than them, but they will not include us because it doesn't make any sense. They are very, uh, they have some, certain structural limitations. What will happen is that the five eyes, if you look at how it's evolved, I've written a paper on that. It's published by Rattlech in case you're interested, you know, you're most welcome to read it. So, um, uh, and uh, after this, when I when I send this presentation to Monojit, I have also given you a list of selected readings. So you can absolutely go and all those readings are there. Whatever I'm referring to is all of those readings. So, in the five eyes, what will happen is that you might have a five eyes plus, which is very mission specific. So if there is a particular intelligence that you need to study, gather about a specific issue, you might have, you know, countries like India, countries like Japan, uh, participating for a while and then sort of, you know, going away. But it is not going to change the basic structure of the five eyes. Similarly with NATO, NATO's basic structure is not going to change. If at all this, it's going to be NATO plus or maybe informal engagements with NATO. So these two are not very relevant for India, even though they are directly relevant for inter security interests, okay, because they're speaking about China this way. So whenever anybody speaks about China, it is about our interests. But I don't think we are going to be joining it. We should not be joining it. India's semantics for the maritime engagement is free, open, and inclusive. So we have to be very mindful of that particular thing because that's where we sort of, you know, and, in, and ultimately, I think the, probably the only last thing I'd say is that when I speak to the West, uh, different Western countries, I think that they honestly really admire, appreciate India's free, open, and inclusive indo pacific concept because it's it actually suits them that they have somebody that can talk to both sides. It actually suits them that they have somebody, uh, you know, that that has such a credible uh, positionality when it comes to global south and blah blah blah. So I think today there is a better understanding of what India's strategic priorities are, what is India's strategic semantics, and even though there is always some sort of a discomfort when it comes to oh, but India never takes names and India never takes sides. But I think they can kind of understand that right now the collaborative approach that India have 
versus the alliance approach that best has. This is actually in the Western interest right now because I told you that end of the day they are worried about their economy. Uh, security, which only multipolarity and which only reduction of the great power contestation can make achieve. So, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, yes, I sh I am going to send you the PPT so that you can take a look at all the maps. Yes. So, thank you, ma'am, for an excellent uh, topic and excellent mission. I will take some of your time more for the question and the maps. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I, I shall revert uh, to my uh, WebEx listeners. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand. Can ask, otherwise, we will take those which are given in the uh, chat box. Anyone who wants to speak, please raise your hand. Okay, so we shall take on the uh, chat box. Just, uh... Yes, sir. Okay, thank you for the elaborate and uh, nuanced lecture and Manjita is a researcher as well. Since you pointed out rightly that the Indo Pacific is largely a local map, rather than a defined geographical region, would you be right? Would be right to assume that the so called rules based border is also a metal construct rather than a Okay. I'll just take it one by one quickly so it becomes easier. So that's a very good question because obviously that uh, it, 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 I mean, it, it is the most natural thing, right? When you say the rules based order, Whose rules are we referring to, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you just reduce it to very basics, I think the rules based order here basically means that nobody should do a unilateral change in the status quo. So nobody should come and say that we have a new territory. Uh, claim. And this, of course, in the Indo Pacific is directed against China because it is basically China that has been leading to all these claims. Uh, not just, um, I mean, of course, we are a book to bogey, we are a victim, of course, at the LAC. But if you look at in the Taiwan, what they did in Hong Kong in 2019, and then what they are always referring to when it comes to Taiwan, and also in the, the South China Sea. So I think when you hear talk about the rules based order, it's about unclaws, upholding the unclaws, upholding you know those kind of uh, you know laws, which is largely in the uh, uh, larger interest of all the players involved, and that is why India. But India is also an adherent. If you look at all the official documents, it says that yes, we uphold the rules based order because ultimately it is about what, what are the laws of the seas and you know, what, are, what are all of that. So, but yes, at a more conceptual level, at a more conceptual level, we could have a, a debate on really whose rules are these and who has set these rules and are the multilateral institutions working? And if not, then but right now I think it, it kind of suffices to say that in a in a more practical sense, it is. Absolutely to do with, uh, you know, the rules around white shipping, pay shipping, uh, and laws, IUU, those kind of things. Yes, yes, yes. Next one, there is a second question also okay. from Marita. Uh, Ma'am, since you mentioned about the IPNDA, there was a dedicated announcement for IPNDA in the Iowa during the Ford Japan meeting in July this year. However, there are Embedded challenges primarily because there are gaps in information sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know are in my how do you think that IP and DA should go out for better collaboration and security? That's an excellent question. That's what I meant when I said that it, it is all great, but end of the day, if you genuinely want to put together a maritime security architecture, at the heart of it is maritime domain awareness, and at the heart of maritime domain awareness is interoperable, you know, and 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 data and information fusion. So if you look at IFC IOR, for example, IFC, IFC IOR, you have more than 40 countries that are signed up for IFC IOR, but is it the same as saying that you have a su sustainable, stable uh, security architecture? I don't think so. I mean, that's just first part because I, I told you the, the problem there is that there is a semantic of that maritime communication which is missing. So, for example, uh, IPMDA, you still do not know that there is going to be a common portal of sharing that information, right? Like the EU, I can tell you, so to speak, they. They, their uh, information sharing uh, or their information uh, you know, uh, thing is called IORIS, which is Indo Pacific Regional Information Sharing System. India's is called MSIS, which is Merchant Ship Information System. Japan, for example, uses MSIL, which is MDA Situational Indication Linkage. Singapore, for example, uses IRIS, which is IFC Real Time Information Sharing System. What I'm saying is that unless you are developing a pathway to link these, which means you have to have a lot. Have to have interoperability and you really have to have a shared strategic perspective and like i said that when you look at indo-pacific these are issues which are not really 
we ironed out. We can't say that today our perspective of China is exactly what Japan's perspective of China is and exactly what the US's perspective. So on the one hand, this limitation is coming from the fact that there is a nuance difference in our strategic perspectives, also in our strategic modus of candies dealing with these issues but end of the day in a limited sense and that is why i think uh, you know if you probably can notice uh, this time if you look at the joint statement it doesn't say real time linking of mda it says near real time linking of the uh, you know of mda so i think this little shift basically shows that yes there is an awareness that there is a difficulty and it cannot be one it cannot mda it mda cannot function like five eyes it can't be like the seamless uh, sharing of intelligence and all that. No. But what we can do is that we can list certain areas, and on those areas, in a limited sense, we can try to have semantics. And if you carefully see the other developments that are happening, right, uh, you will see that with now there are gradual steps that are being taken towards building more accountability and more trust and more all of that. So I think that, that's why I said that it's a work in progress. So we will get there because if we don't get there, then just having an IFC IOR center and getting more signatories to it, or you know, having this vision or that vision is not really going to solve the problem of having a sustainable maritime security architecture. That maritime security architecture has to have MDS. That's that's probably my analysis. Anybody else from the WebEx participants? Please use your hand and put your question in the chat box. Okay, if there is none, we will revert back to the people who are here and we, I will go clockwise. I'll give opportunity to everybody. Starting with Gupta Mehta. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Very insightful and uh, enlightening. Uh, I will pick, uh, since the topic was so vast and we covered so, such a wide range of uh, issues, packed it into your talk. So I will not go to very specifics. Uh, I will pick up the thread from where you said uh, Anglosphere and I5. I will just give you a perspective that can we view the entire Indo-Pacific uh, that we are talking about in a very different way. It is uh, from the point of view of trust quotient and dependability quotient. And you know the in Anglo sphere and I5 have the highest level of dependability and trust portion, and that's why they are a group. And therefore, I view uh, AUKUS, why AUKUS has been created, because these are the three Anglo sphere countries who trust. And ultimately, Indo Pacific is about uh, two protagonists it is the China and US. And everybody has to take a position in that. And when you take a position, apart from the Anglosphere, these three countries, the others are very, uh, position are very nebulous. I mean, they are not 100% sure where they are. And therefore, can we view it as a security ring at the core of which rests the uh, AUKUS? And then you come the Quad, and then you come uh, NATO, and uh, and other countries. So when the uh, when the balloon goes up, the person who is going to actually do the action are not the peripheral people. They will be supportive, but the core will actually take the full. Right? Can we view it this way? This is uh, an enemy. Yeah. So, well, hypothetically speaking, sir, I think you're not completely wrong because I mean, if you look at if push comes to shove, I mean, who? Who are we going to choose between the US and China? I mean, it's it's something we obviously don't want to do, and we are trying our best to not let happen. And we are not alone. Trust me, that's what the Europeans are trying to do as well. Yeah. Because the kind of that's dependence. Really it's that's, that's the quote. But like I said, that if it is about like I, I just give you a little um uh, anic, like, like, like just a little bit of detail from, for example, what I keep hearing from different uh, scenario building exercises, right? So, for example, the Germans. Now, it's the Germans that are the most dependent on the uh, on Europe, right? And if you look at the EU's uh, de-risking, EU's de-risking is not able to fly because Germany is always pulling it down, yeah. right? Okay, I mean, the French are more hawkish because, and everybody, the Germans are like, oh, what happens to our Mercedes? What happens to our Volkswagen? What happens to BAS? What happened to, you know, all the production? Largest trade partner. Largest trade partner, you know. Now, 
if you look at the German view, it gives you an understanding of really how, um, I mean, how extreme things have gone, which is that, see, they're saying, we don't want to take sides and we don't want to decouple from China. We cannot decouple. Okay, we need to basically see what is happening in our backyard. We need to put together so many things. We have so many economic problems. We don't want this nonsense. You know, we don't. Okay, in principle, it's okay. But this is like when center us parables. If everything is okay, we would love to do this. We would love to do that. But right now, we can't. It is about our existence. But if China really goes to the extent of doing something foolish in the Taiwan Straits or in South China Sea, where our economic, uh, you know, lifeline is. So end of the day, whether we like it or we don't, somewhere, and, and also very quickly, because your question is, and I would just like to add, you know, there are three kind of orders in the world today. There's a global security order, which is still dominated largely by the US. There's a global economic order, which is not dominated by any one country. You will see a lot more and more multipolarity in this particular order. And there's a global digital order, which is still coming up. And if you carefully see, the way the global digital order is going and the way the global digital order is cutting across the security order and the economic order, whoever partakes into the co-development and uh, co-regulation of this digital order is eventually going to have more say in both the security order and the economic order. And if you see how India's defense industries uh, are growing, you will see that now we are we have such a push towards technological innovation. Why? What really drives it in the US? It's not about just one deal here or deal there. Of course, we know that we are paying too much for that. Okay. At the end of the day, this is about industries. It's about uh, you know all these uh, things that really bind us uh, when it comes to the semiconductors. You know, gallium nitride, silicon carbide. These are not uh, simple semiconductors. These are semiconductors which have strategic implications, which are going to be used in all our radars and all our things so i think end of the day somewhere we have to realize is that right now things are a little fuzzy and it is in everybody's interest as long as things remain fuzzy because nobody wants to go to a world or nobody wants to wake up to a morning where there is a clarion call from what is going to happen um i if you ask my opinion i mean i'm not really an expert on what china is going to think do or uh, you know think on taiwan but i think the chinese also have a lot of economic problems and Somewhere the argument is that you have to keep them engaged so that, and that's what India is also somewhere doing, that we have to keep them engaged so that we don't really go to that worst case. But if there is a worst case, I'm sorry, I think it would rather be a very, very US centric thing, perhaps, and nobody really wants to do that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DG, sir, for the opportunity to attend the event, and thank you, Dr. Rao, for this scintillating talk. A few things you talk about uh, France's Indo-Pacific document, which is which exists. You see, they use the word quadrilateral in that. So what you are calling the quad, really, that is the India, Australia, Japan, U.S. quad, is really the Northern quad. That is the Southern quad of Australia, New Zealand, France, and U.S. So very few people know it exists. So really, you should. You are talking, so really one should say whether one is talking about the northern or southern quad. Because AUKUS or anything apart, France has not left the southern quad. Secondly, to uh, kind of uh, endorse your point about the economic concerns about uh, France. You see, one is why the UK talks about an Indo-Pacific pivot. The polit executive and political part of the House of Commons Select Committee. So you are a reviewer for Russi, you must be reading their reports. They have rejected the whole concept of this Indo-Pacific pivot. They believe that UK should concentrate on the Euro-Atlantic. The House of Commons Public Accounts Select Committee has raised economic concerns. So maybe it's the same concern with all European countries. Now you talk about uh, France's Pacific territory. They also have Reunion Island. That's still a French territory. And of course, the Chagos Islands have been returned to Mauritius. You see, when you talk about Norway or Sweden or any other Northern European country, now I'm sorry, what I'm going to say will sound geographically incongruous to you. But all these Northern European countries have an Indo-Pacific neighbor. You see, the country to the east of all these Northern European countries happens to be an Indo-Pacific power. And if only one goes back to the days of INS Chakra, you have not once, I'm sorry, but I don't mean to criticize you, but you've never once mentioned Russia. 
No, when you say it, uh, you're, I mean, if you look at it from India's point of view, assuming there's a US-China conflict, you see, there's no way India is going to ignore Russia. India, in a sense, particularly continue on the defense production and in the maritime sphere, and if you go back to INS Chakra again, India can never, in a sense, decouple from Russia, if you like, Soviet Union apart. So how do you see these, particularly the role of Russia is some, the only question which I really have to ask is, what is the role of Russia going to be in the India? And the last point I'll make, coming to what you say about Sweden and about Finland and Sweden joining NATO, if you ask me, it's only a de jure confirmation of a de facto situation. They were always part of the JEF. So informally, they've always been participating in NATO formations. So if you keep all this together and look at the Russian position, the fact that they have Russia on, on their immediate neighborhood, and assuming a war starts, would you comment on what Russia will do and what India's overall the role of Russia and India's uh, relationship to the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis Russia. Thank you. Yes, the, yes, you're right. I mean, I uh, uh, I did not mention uh, the role of Russia. I I don't think Russia is really a very relevant Indo-Pacific uh, player right now because two things. One is because Russia is really concentrated on what is happening in in you know in its neighborhood. And if you carefully see the export base has shrunk. I mean, this this is what it is. I mean, it, and even if you remember in your remarks, you're saying they're going back to the China which is that you have to go back in time to see that Russia was very relevant in this uh, region. It still continues to be, especially in Bangladesh, which is a good thing for India, because in Bangladesh, you know, a lot of uh, nuclear, so to say, cooperation is happening between Bangladesh and Russia, and they've signed a lot of agreements. And from our perspective, we would rather not let China take the take the and right? we would rather have somebody like Russia there. The big, the little problem that I see with Russia is, especially after, uh, and, and that's that's a good thing, because I didn't have the time, because I did mention, if you remember, uh, the connecting of the security theaters. And one of the things that I do see happening is, again, it's a work in progress, so I don't have the real proper contours uh, absolutely clear, but I do see that if you carefully see how uh, Russia talks about the Indo-Pacific, they, they talk in a Chinese semantics right now, because right now they want to be against the US, led, uh, uh, you know, things. So right now, I think India is not really so much on their minds. The, the idea is to basically undermine what the U.S. stands for and what the Western bloc stands for, which is Indo-Pacific. So Russia is always referring to uh, Indo-Pacific as Asia-Pacific. That's first. And then, and the other thing is that Russia is also, uh, if you noticed, and I have written a lot, a great deal about how the war in Ukraine is leading to a strategic deepening between Russia and China. And eventually what it means for India is something that we will have to wait and watch. But we are seeing that after the war has begun, we have not replaced any border with Russia. Now, does that mean that the old defense uh, ties will cut off? No, absolutely not. They can't because we have like some productions, we have something that proposed, we have something like, you know, we have the Sukhoi, uh, MK30, etc. And we have the Russia, of course, we have a lot of things. But what I'm trying to tell you is that this is a situation which is, I think, a very fuzzy situation. You have Russia, China, the increase, I've written a great deal about it, the, the increase of joint military drills between Russia and China, between how they refer to this region as Asia Pacific. From Russia's perspective, this is not directed against India. This is directed against the Western alliance. They look at Indo-Pacific being the Western construct. That is why they refer to this region as that. So in my opinion, it is not really a very relevant player right now in the Indo-Pacific. That's not really where uh, you know most of its trade or something is going from. That's not really, uh, if they are, I see that in Russia is more worried about the Arctic, and I see that is where that is a theater. If we were discussing the Arctic, I would discuss a lot of very productive things about what India is planning to do with Russia. And the other thing would be that I would rather wait and see how this is very really impacting. Because right now, I see that the export base has shrunk. We have not really based on water. That's 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 there. What about the Chennai Bloody Vostok corridor? That's all through the, yeah, so the Chennai Bloody Vostok corridor. Uh, one of the th reasons why it is not really taking off. Uh, you know, in the same way, and India. Okay, so from economic multipolarity perspective, connectivity. I said it's a great thing. India right now is actually perfectly justified in having the Chennai Bloody Vostok uh, corridor and also trying to have the INSTC, which is you know from India, then going all the way uh, to Iran, and uh, you know all of that. But end of the day, I think whether India is able to really reach a particular kind of exports. Or export potential because these remain to be sanctioned entities is something that time can tell. 
Okay, so I think that was the reason where I felt that this is not really a very pivotal factor. But having Russia in India's in 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 Bangladesh and in this region, I think from India's perspective, it is a good. You know, it is not something that we are uncomfortable. Okay, but how it plays out. For example, it is obviously going to be dependent on how far the Ukraine war is actually pushing Russia with China because Russia has done a North Korea uh, Russia defense cooperation. Russia has already, uh, you know, um, um, financing the Hezbollah. I mean, why do you think the Israelis actually bombed the Russian base in Syria? Okay, so these are things where, you know, one has to keep in mind. And I think that these are limitations that these are going to play out. And the reason I didn't say that, and would you raise it, is because I, I genuinely do not have an answer of how far will it play out. We have to wait and see. I don't see Russia turning against India. But the limitation that Russia can play a role in facilitating is something that I would really have to see. Doesn't have the resources right now to make it. Right. If it doesn't have the resources to sort of, uh, you know, um, to make its drones, you're buying Iran, uh, Shahid drones from Iran, you're buying ammunition from North Korea. You know, I mean, you can obviously see that this is a time when Russia is more inward looking than ever. So, going back to that, I mean, Chakra, maybe Chakra 3 is not coming. We don't know. I mean, it's, I don't think it's coming. That is why India is now, you know, looking at developing perhaps, uh, you know, its own uh, um, fleet of submarines. So what I'm saying is that this is something which is right now, if you ask my opinion on it, I honestly don't have a very clear cut opinion because there are changes. I would never shy away from saying that right now, today's Russia is very inward looking. It remains to be, uh, you know, a sanctioned entity and there are limits to how much export and that is why we are, we are having this huge uh, deficit, trade deficit with Russia. 70 billion worth of trade we have with Russia and 67 billion of that is, uh, 67 billion of that, that is trade deficit. So, I think all these things, perhaps only time can tell. When the war ends, when things come back to normal, I think that India will always engage, but that engagement will transfer. So, since we... Yeah, that's <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, I'm Priyanka, I'm Research Assistant at Sanjus, and thank you for that comprehensive lecture and uh, uh, telling about the EU in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you talked about in your lecture about the different connotations which have like in the sense of maritime borders, like uh, let's say France being a resident power and then India and US, so to say. And uh, in that aspect, I just wanted to ask you a quick simple question that what is China's vision? with respect to the Indo-Pacific, because in the first place, it is not even recognize the idea of Indo-Pacific. It is yeah. like it is an Asia-Pacific. Yeah. So how does China view and what is China's idea of this whole region of Indo-Pacific and what would be the uh, main content stations where China would emerge? Obviously, China is uh, there in the South China Sea. Then it's approach, you know, with the with the Taiwan and with the Philippines. And its presence, uh, you know, in the uh, in the ports, uh, in the Hambadra port in Sri Lanka. So yeah. So how do you just see China's vision in in this whole emerging scenario? China too much. Uh, China's perspective, it completely rejects. You know, it says that there is no business for outsiders to be in uh, in this region. I mean, Asia is for Asians. And uh, end of the day, China believes in an Asian order which is led by China. Okay. So China, by the way, if you've seen the kanji, anybody here speaks or writes Chinese, uh, the first uh, character is, is like this box, which is cut like this, which means the Middle Kingdom, so it's Chu Goku, which means that it's the center of the world. So from Chinese perspective, this is for China, it's China's backyard, nobody, no, no one else has any business. By the way, I was in Shanghai recently and it was very interesting because they, when they spoke, they actually spoke as if they were living in a daydream. So they said, well, you know, China has always been so, this was about this expansion, okay? And they said that, oh, but you know, Chinese have been so know, status quo -est and you know, Chinese have been so peace loving, we have never really invaded a country. And now we see India is completely changing the status coach it in India is trying to change the balance in South Asia by giving weapons to Philippines by giving weapons to Vietnam and, and China, India sorry India is doing all this by giving weapons to Vietnam uh, and Philippines and India shouldn't be doing that because you know we are the countries uh, in the region and uh, it's China is not doing anything wrong and then, then they say and then when we ask them but by the way for Bangladesh, you are the biggest uh, defense exporter to Bangladesh, and we don't like it. You are also the biggest defense exporter of Pakistan, we don't like it. And then this, no, but they, but those are for defensive capabilities. What is your problem? Everybody, all countries. So after a while, you understand that they have a completely different view of how they look at it, and it's a completely, you know. It's, it's international relations with Chinese characteristics, if you can allow me to say. It's like socialism with Chinese characteristics. They are, they think that their nine dash line is their birthright. 
the unification of the five chinese races is the is the basic core objective of the chinese state and that was, those are the five stars that you see on the chinese flag and then which means that in 100 years from now so when you see you know, in the china in china was made and then like within 100 years of that they want to basically unify all the five races so for from the, from their understanding they are doing uh, correct yes, yes. and the same way they are doing the, th the, the same things and the 9-9 is also there was it was theirs and it was all the other countries of the region that are unnecessarily dividing ASEAN they are dividing the rest of the world they are dividing Europe also by the way so they are uh, they are angry with everybody specifically with the US but at the same time I think I don't think that the CCP or Xi Jinping is really that naive I think he also understands the cost involved in this because uh, uh, and I, that is probably the only hope that everybody has. That end of the day, perhaps better sense can prevail. And because China is not really like Russia, see, it was easier for Russia to wage that war because Russia was not really so embedded into global supply chains, right? But China is really embedded into global supply chains, and this kind of uh, sanctioning is going to hurt sanctions as well i mean even when russia was not embedded in the supply chains you can see the sanctions were also hurting the west so much okay so in the case of china nobody really wants to get there even they keep saying so i honestly hope that better sense will prevail but from the chinese perspective it is completely their backyard and they are not doing anything wrong they are the most peace loving and they are the most status quoest country in the world that's that's, that, that's what they say uh, first of all thank you ma'am for a very comprehensive talk and very detailed but my question is, you mentioned about Taiwan and semiconductors and the disruption of uh, supply chain. So now that we see most of the Indo-Pacific countries now, uh, be Japan now pumping a lot of more money in this semiconductor sector, including India, there is a strong political will. So then where is Europe? Like how much can it offer a supply chain resilience or, you know, like, and in NATO also, I uh, think in 2023 in the NATO summit, most of the South, uh, Global hub of semiconductor, South Korea, Japan, they participated in any critical and emerging technology has been well. Yes. Very quickly, uh, I mean, uh, the EU and India have signed so much for the GPC of the Trade and Technology Council. And the Trade and Technology Council is something which is quite unprecedented because it's the first DTC that India has signed with anybody, and it's the second DTC that EU has signed. Their first DTC is with the US. Okay. Second, now in the TTC, uh, they talk about how to, again, it's an, it's an entwining of trade and technology and the realization and recognition of the fact that in today's times, technology, pillar of technology is going to actually cross cut, uh, whether it's economics or whether it's, you know, any such thing. And um, some time ago, I think earlier this year, they signed an MOU on semiconductors. But unlike the situation that we have with the US, where we again not only signed a fabrication agreement uh, with the US when Modi, Prime Minister Modi had gone to the US uh, this September, uh, I think the main reason why the EU India MOU semiconductor stuff, nothing much has happened, there are two reasons. One is that from India's perspective, we have not been able to make use of China plus one diversification. Okay, the investments are not coming. India. The investments are going to countries like Singapore, countries like Vietnam. Yeah. And this is not happening because uh, they don't want it. It is not happening because, you know, we really do not have an investment friendly, uh, you know, ecosystem that the current government, I would say, is trying to change to a huge extent. But they still need to you know, go a little far and then give the bilateral say, uh, investment guarantees. Because what has happened is after COVID, after Ukraine, after Israel, you know, after West Asia, it is very difficult to de risk capital. And that is why even IMEC is not free. We, we didn't talk about IMEC at all because I didn't touch on that region, but because it was also connectivity. But coming back, uh, so China plus one diversification is not, the, those investments are not coming from Europe. Uh, what is coming to India? Okay, individual countries, you will see some investment, non-EU countries, for example, the EFTA countries have talked about uh, doing 100 million worth of investment in the next 15 years. Also, you have the US uh, doing I think the major difference uh, that nobody really speaks about is that when it comes to the US, uh, the semiconductor agreement is actually, uh, it is a part of uh, ICET, it is a part of Indus X, you know, it is a part of the Defense Industrial Roadmap and all that, it talks about semiconductors. It is steered at the NSA. Whereas when it comes to the EU India semiconductor and the TTC, it is not yet steered at the NSA. So there is a bit of this gap of, uh, not being and, and i think you know where, where is that coming from because india still doesn't see europe as a major strategic partner okay and i will give you a difference and it'll uh, example and it'll clarify things recently nsa was had gone to france 
recently, very recently. I mean, he just came back two, three days ago. He came back and then he went to Germany. So, when he went to France, when he went to France, it was about uh, steering the technological innovation part. And, you know, we have signed a very ambitious defense industrial roadmap for France, which is still classified. Okay. So, um, what I'm trying to say is that if we want to make the technological, so to say, critical and emerging technology cooperation work, I think we have to link it to the strategic objectives of our country, right? Therefore, I see that in the case of USS, it is so successful. I mean, in no time it is signed. In no time we know how much money is going to be mobilized. Whether it is mobilized, it's a different thing. I, I, for that, I cannot give any guarantees because at the end of the day, uh, day, these are all private players. But we know that we are going to be talking about two major kind of semiconductors, which are complex semiconductors. Right now, India imports 1 billion worth of those uh, complex semiconductors, gallium nitride and the silicon carbide. And this particular agreement with the US is about these two. We also know where exactly you know, the, the plants are going to be set up. But end of the day, where is the fuel coming from? The fuel is coming from the fact that it is steered by the NSA, right? In the case of the EU, I don't think it's going anywhere because that strategic dimension is missing. And until and unless you do that, you have signed an MOU, I'm not sure uh, whether it, it can take off. So what we are thinking right now is that for the last couple of years, we have not had the EU-India summit. There's an annual summit that happens every year. This EU India summit is going to happen in 2025. So what we are hoping is that they will have to they will have to give give away some some big news, right? So perhaps they will probably talk about some Seneca. But right now we have no plans for it. At the end of the day, the plans are not coming because investment is not coming because the investments. Are, so it's linked, you know, uh, one by one. And if you want this to be pushed, it has to be connected to the strategic objectives of the country. Okay, so the US is very clear on that. Whether the EU is as clear on that right now, I'm not very sure because see the US knew part of, so with Taiwan, they don't have a security treaty, right? They are very strategically ambiguous when it comes to Taiwan. But because of the sheer dependence they had on Taiwan when it came to chips, it was clear that tomorrow if there's an attack on Taiwan, US will come to protect its own interests and therefore they will land up uh, protecting Taiwan. And that is what the US identified and tried to get away from when they, when they started their chips. When they did the, the chip shield act, they said that no, we need to shield us. We are too vulnerable. Okay, we can't be only dependent on T, uh, TSMC. You know? We can't only be dependent on that because most of that component is coming from us. And that is why US has taken this call to French for the supply chains of these semiconductors to relatively more uh, you know, uh, reliable partners. Now, India is a reliable partner, that's fine. But, you know, when it comes to India, we are still starting. Like I said, we were only importing 1 billion worth of uh, complex semiconductors. Now, uh, you can't imagine that in two years alone, we are going to completely change the system. But I think this is something that really India needed. And the success lies because I think, to be very, very frank, it is steered at the NSA. That the strategic dimension is viewed very clearly. With the EU, we don't see that. That's sure. right. Ashiga? Take it off, Take it off, also, okay. so uh, it amazed you to only thank you for thank this thank you. That. And actually, you know, uh, when one was hearing, not only uh, covering the subject per se, are also navigating us so many issues so comprehensively. But when you say collective, I really do. It's tremendous. You are a real PhD, and we at least, you know, I can say for myself, I'm in a nursery at this stage. That's so kind of you. But uh, we really heard that kind of speaker and uh, person, and we uh, are really feeling great and good for hours of having invited you. Thank so you. that's just your generosity. Yeah. That's just your generosity. But it was for me, from my perspective, thank you very much. But it was for me, it was like, you know, summing up all the work that I've been trying to do in the last so many years. And trust me, I very much know that, you know, most of these slides, actually one slide is one, entire topic in its own right. So uh, then we sort of get to something more specific. But, you know, whenever my book comes out, please do read it. One is on uh, Europe's, uh, the changing humanities of deterrence after what has happened in Ukraine. And it tackles all these questions that, you know, Sir was asking about what happens to that question, what happens to Taiwan, what happens to Indo-Pacific, what happens to Europe, what happens to all that. So uh, whenever that comes, of course, I'm going to, you know, uh, apprise you all of that.